Welcome back to sociolinguistics. So we are here studying sociolinguistics. We are applying the knowledge we gained in core linguistics about the nuts and bolts of how language works in order to now describe how language is structured within a society, and in particular, the ways that language varies within a society. So sociolinguistics is exactly that. It's the study of how language is used in communities, large communities, and how language varies within and between those communities. A speaker's individual language variety is what's called an idiolect. So everyone speaks in a way which is slightly different from other people, and that is their own idiolect. When a group of speakers speaks in a way which is noticeably different from another group of speakers, we say that group speaks a dialect. And a group of people that speaks a dialect is called a speech community. If two speakers of two dialects can understand one another, we say that the dialects are mutually intelligible. Otherwise, we say they're mutually unintelligible. If two dialects are mutually intelligible, then usually we say they're the same language. But remember the complications and political factors I talked about last time. Otherwise, we usually say that they are different languages. Dialects can differ from each other, not only in their sounds, but also in their morphology and in their syntax. So we will resume with our tour of American dialects. And then when we're done with that, we're going to talk about dialects that are not based on geography, dialects that are based on other forms of speech communities, and the question of where do standard dialects come from? So our next dialect we're going to look at is the South, in which Appalachia is a special area. So the Southern dialect in the US is primarily characterized by the pin-pen merger, which we talked about, and also a phonological rule called monophthongization. So this is when diphthongs become monophthongs. That's monophthongization. For example, in southern U.S. dialects, the word which is usually pronounced wide in standard American English is going to be pronounced wide. So the phonemes wide come out as the sound wide. The rule is actually that the phoneme, the diphthong I, is expressed as the sound I when it appears before certain consonants. And it actually depends on the dialect area within the south what those consonants are. The southern dialect also has certain syntactic forms which are not present in other dialects. So in Southern American English, you can say something like, I might could help you clean your house tomorrow. Now in California English, this would get the star for being ungrammatical, but this is perfectly grammatical in Southern US English. I think you can work out what it means. It means I might be able to help you clean your house tomorrow. This syntactic phenomenon is called double modals. So verbs like might and could are called modal verbs. And in standard American English, you can only have one main modal verb per sentence. However, in Southern US English, you can have two. Like I might could help you, there's also might should and so on. So that's Southern dialect. Next, I'll talk about Appalachia, which is sort of embedded within the South here, but which is a distinct dialect region. So the Appalachian dialect is spoken in the remote areas of the Appalachian Mountains out east, and it's noticeable for preserving many archaic features of English, features that used to be part of Standard English a long time ago, but which are now preserved only in this Appalachian dialect. In particular, there's this morphological form called a prefixing. You can say something like, he come a running to tell me the news. That prefix a uh, in a running, that is, a, it's a bit of morphology, which used to be part of the standard English language, but no longer is, but it's preserved in the Appalachian English dialect in the US. Appalachian English also contains a number of irregular verbs, which are no longer part of the standard language. Things like the verb heat having the past tense het instead of heated, using an alternation to express the past tense rather than an affixation. It also has multiple negation. In fact, this is common in working class dialects, which we're going to talk about soon, all over the US. In Appalachian English, you say things like, he didn't have no lunch, I didn't have no lunch. This is perfectly grammatical 
in Appalachian English, and I want to emphasize that there is no sense from a linguistic perspective in which this is illogical. This is not illogical, it just happens to be that in the grammar of this dialect, when you express negation, you express it simultaneously in multiple places. In other dialects, you'd say, I didn't have any lunch. But again, this is actually something which used to be standard. So before the 16th century in English, I didn't have no lunch was the standard way to say, I didn't have any lunch. And then the standard language changed. But many regional dialects retained the older form, including Appalachian English. So that's Appalachian English. Now I'll turn to the Midland, this interesting area in the sort of middle latitudes of the United States, encompassing areas of Indiana, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Missouri. The Midland dialect is characterized by phonological variants like the following. The phoneme O is expressed as the sound O, so as in boat would be pronounced boat. There's also a phenomenon called L vocalization. So the phoneme L is expressed as the sound W when it appears after a vowel. So for example, the word hill is gonna come out as hu in this dialect. The word belt is gonna come out as bout in this dialect. There's also syntactic forms that are particular to the Midlands. In particular, it's this positive anymore, and this is really how you identify someone from this area. This is really the main thing that you would probably notice about someone who speaks this dialect as opposed to a standard dialect. So this is a syntactic form that doesn't exist in standard English. In a Midland dialect, you can say something like, the gas station sells gas anymore. Now, if this is standard American English, if this is California English, I think you'd put the star on this and call it ungrammatical, but it's perfectly well formed within the Midlands dialect. What it means is something like the gas station sells gas these days, like it didn't used to, but now it does. So the gas station sells gas anymore in Midlands dialect means now it sells gas it didn't used to. Now the last dialect region, major dialect region I'm going to turn to is the West. And uh, as many of you are UC Irvine students, this is the dialect that you grew up speaking, that you grew up immersed in, if you grew up speaking English. So let's get to it. In the West, I think many people think of themselves as not speaking any particular dialect, and that's because Western dialect is indeed pretty close to the standard American English dialect. But we're going to see that there are in fact strong characteristics, strong dialect characteristics of the West. So in particular, the phonological variants look like this. We have that the phoneme U is expressed as the sound U everywhere. So it's a shift that looks something like this. The high back vowel u gets expressed as the high rounded central vowel u, as in something like dude instead of dude. So the word dude comes out as dude instead of dude. Or the word nu comes out as nu. This is a process of fronting. The Western dialect is also, as we've seen, characterized by the cot cot merger. So what happened here is that the phoneme a moved down and merged with the phoneme a, and then you didn't get a chain shift, you just got a merger. So the phoneme a moved down to the phoneme a, the phoneme a didn't like move to get out of the way, and so you end up with a merger, the words cot and cot end up sounding the same in Western dialect. There's also a general tendency everywhere for vowels to move down. So if you want to fake a strong California accent, one way you can do it is just by thinking of every vowel in the utterance you want to produce, and then just move it down one step in this chart. And you should try it out. It's actually quite humorous. It ends up sounding like the, uh, the sketch, the, the Californians from SNL. So those are the major dialect regions of the US. And again, here's the more detailed map. We're not gonna go into the much more detailed fine-grained dialect gradations that we could get into. But these are the major geographical dialects within the US. And I hope they've provided you with an interesting tour of the language diversity in the country within the English language, um, not even extending yet to the other languages that are spoken in the US. And also um, of the way in which dialects are structured, the kinds of changes in phonology, morphology, syntax, which define dialects. 
What I want to talk about now is dialects that are not defined by geography. They're not defined by regions. Rather, they're defined by social groups. We've looked at regional dialects so far. But there's also social dialects. Social dialects are dialects that are associated with a particular class or race or gender. These often intersect with the regional dialects in very interesting ways. So one of the main aspects of social dialect and class dialect in particular in the US is roticity. So in the Northeast US and actually in other areas of the US too, non-roticity is a major feature of working class dialect. So this also extends to the Southern US dialect region. An example of this was given in a famous sociolinguistic study that was done in 1972. So William LeBeau was a pioneering sociolinguist and one of the most famous studies he did was the following, which demonstrates that being non-rhotic is a property of a more working class dialect, even within a region, whereas being more rhotic and having more R's is a property of a less working class status within that region. So here's what Bill LeBeau did. He did a study on department stores in New York in 1972. What he did was he went to a bunch of department stores and he found some item that was on the fourth floor and then he went to some attendant and asked, you know, where can I find that item? Such that the attendant would respond by saying fourth floor. And then he noted down, was that attendant saying fourth floor in the rhotic dialect or were they saying fourth floor in the non rhotic dialect? Now, if you've ever been to different department stores, you know that they are somewhat striated by class in the United States. There's certainly high class department stores and mid to lower class depart uh, department stores in the US. So if you go to these different department stores, you can note down what class they're associated with. And you can note down how often people respond with fourth floor as opposed to fourth floor, how often they use the rhotic variety as opposed to the non rhotic variety. So the phonemes here are always fourth floor, but in a rhotic dialect that'll come out as fourth floor, and in a non-rhotic dialect that'll come out as fourth floor. In particular in New York, the non-rhotic dialects replace the R with a schwa. So remember in Boston it's actually deleted, but in the New York dialects the R is replaced with a schwa, so you get fourth floor, as opposed to fourth floor, which it would be in Boston. So. Bill LeBeau went to these department stores. He went to Saks Fifth Avenue. That's high socioeconomic status. It's like the premier, all the great and the good, you know, all the fashionable people go to Saks Fifth Avenue in New York. And in Saks Fifth Avenue, 63% of the time people said fourth floor with the rhotic dialect. And the remaining 37% of the time they said fourth floor with a non rhotic dialect. Then he went to Macy's. Macy's is, let's say, medium status. It's certainly lower status than Saks Fifth Avenue. Um, and at Macy's, people said fourth floor with the rhotic dialect 44% of the time. And they said fourth floor with the non rhotic dialect 56% of the time. So we see as the class is going down, as the socioeconomic status is going down, the incidence of the non rhotic dialect is going up. And then Bilbo went to S. Klein, which is like some bargain bin place. It is here like next to the bargain center in Newark. And he asks people for that item on the fourth floor. And in, in S. Klein, people only said fourth floor with the rhotic variety 8% of the time. And the rest of the time, overwhelming majority, they said fourth floor with a non rhotic dialect. So this was a study which demonstrated the quantitative effect of class on language variety. We have an association of this particular aspect of the Northeast language variety with working class status. On the other hand, notice that in the UK, it's actually the non rhotic dialect, which is the high status dialect. And in the UK, the rhotic dialects are the working class ones. So it's actually the opposite in the US and the UK. In the US, pronouncing your R's is standard and high class, and dropping your R's is, is more working class. In the UK, 
Listen to the queen. Listen to the queen of England. She drops her arch, right? She says, um, she says, if you imagine the queen saying anything with an R in it, if she says like, come over, then she's dropped the R using a non-rhotic dialect. But if you ever talk to a working class person from especially Southern England, then you'll find that they pronounce their R's. They use rhotic dialect. So the situation's actually exactly reversed in the UK. And the reason rhotic dialects are so common in the US is that many immigrants from the UK to the US early on uh, were working class. And so that's how that happened. <clears throat> Other features of working class dialect in the US, these are features which are shared across dialect regions, are things like the use of the word ain't instead of isn't and aren't. Things like double negation, which we saw in the Appalachian dialect. Remember, double negation is not illogical, it's just a different dialect, just a different syntactic form. There are also dialects associated with certain ethnicities within the United States. Of these, the most major is probably uh, African American Vernacular English. That's the linguistic term which is pronounced as AV. This refers to the set of dialects spoken by African Americans in the US. So AV is characterized by similar phonology in most cases to Southern American English, although the monophthongization process applies to more different consonants than it does in the usual white varieties of this dialect. For example, it has the pin-pen merger, it has monophthongization, and it is sometimes non-rhotic. So you have, again, this distinction based on class, which is signaled by roticity, even within African American vernacular English. Also very interestingly, African American vernacular English retains certain linguistic features which are inherited from Western African languages. In particular, the syntactic forms for expressing tense in African American vernacular English are actually more fine-grained than the system in standard American English, and they appear to inherit from Western African languages. Another major ethnic variety in the US is Chicano English, which refers to the set of dialects spoken by second or third generation English speakers of Mexican descent. So these are people who maybe don't speak Spanish, but their dialect of English is distinct. So it's not just a mixture of English and Spanish. It's often spoken by people who don't speak Spanish, and it has a lot of influence from Spanish phonology. It has a kind of monophthongization, different than the kind of monophthongization you see in the South. So here the phoneme, the diphthong O, would be pronounced as the sound O, and the phoneme I is going to be expressed as the sound E when it appears before ng. These are features of Spanish phonology carried over into the Chicano English variety of American English. There's also many Spanish lexical items in this dialect. So if we continue examining the structure of dialects, we'll see that it's not only based on region and geography. It's not only based on class. It's not only based on ethnicity. It's also based on, even within dialects, things called style and register. So every speaker of every dialect speaks differently in different contexts. For example, if you meet the Queen of England, you're going to greet her differently than if you meet your old friend on the street, right? That's a question of register. Are you using a formal register to talk to the queen or an informal register to talk to your friend on the street? Every language has what are called different registers. These are things like casual, informal, careful, formal. The particular words you use, the syntactic forms you use, even sometimes the phonology you use will vary depending on your register. When addressing the Queen of England, you're going to use a formal register. Speakers also engage in something called style shifting. That's when you actually vary the use of dialect features and register features depending on contexts, often in very complex, intricate ways which signal interesting configurations of identity and status and so on. <clears throat> People automatically use dialect features as signals of their regional and their social identity. It's often an unconscious process. So we've seen that there are a wide variety of English dialects, but what I want to talk about now is what is the sociological structure of those dialects within the US. So in the US, 
we have these regional dialects, which intersect with the ethnic dialects, class dialects, and so on. Each has its own system of registers. There is also something called a standard dialect, something which I've talked about. It's something called standard American English. Now, what is that? This is the particular dialect which is spoken in formal settings. So the formal register is the most standard American English register. The particular dialect spoken in formal settings, in broadcast media, by political leaders, by people with relatively high socioeconomic status. It's also sometimes called television English, which gives you a sense of where it came, comes from and how it propagated in the country. So a standard dialect is a dialect which you are taught in school, which is like a default dialect, which is used when people come together who don't speak the same dialect. It's often a dialect where people within the society will say that it is incorrect not to speak that dialect. Remember, we're not prescriptivist as linguists. We're not interested in what's correct and incorrect. We're interested in describing what's going on. We observe as linguists that there is a thing called a standard dialect. It's what people learn in school. It's what they talk in, on TV. It's what people give speeches in. And there's also regional dialects. Standard American English is not any more correct than any other dialect. It's just another dialect which happens to have been selected as the standard. So standard American English is a dialect just like any other. And I want to emphasize that there is no sense, no scientific sense, in which standard American English is more logical than any other dialect. So where does standard American English come from? Remember, I said it's a dialect. So what is that dialect? It turns out we can actually answer this geographically. What is standard American English? It comes from here. And it comes from the time of around the 1940s and the 1930s. So it's something like a northern dialect, but it became the standard before the northern cities shift hit the northern dialect. So why did this regional dialect from this particular time end up becoming the standard American English dialect? Well, this is around the time that broadcast media was starting to become extremely influential. And this area at that time was the center of population for the United States. So this ended up being the dialect that was used on radio and is used in movies and it was used on TV. This ended up, this what was originally a regional dialect ended up becoming the standard American English dialect. And there's actually a lot of very interesting history there. So before the 1930s and 40s, there was a different dialect which was considered standard American English. If you listen to, or you watch old Hollywood movies or listen to old broadcasts, you'll notice that people talk in a kind of different way, right? Think about Audrey Hepburn and the dialect she speaks in. It's a non-rhotic dialect. So there was an old standard American English, which is now called um, transatlantic English, which was non-rhotic. And then around the late 1930s and the 1940s, that was replaced with modern standard American English or television English through basically through the influence of broadcast media. So our current standard dialect in the US is a rhotic dialect, which is basically the regional dialect from this area in this time. And many features that are now associated with regional or working class dialects of English used to be part of the standard dialect. This goes towards making the point that standard American English is not any more logical than any other dialect. It just happens to be the case that this dialect got selected to be the standard. So you can see a lot of stuff which exists only in regional dialects now in old, older varieties of English. So for example, in Chaucer, this is considered you know, beautifully well-crafted English from the 15th century. You get sentences like, he never yet no villainy ye ne said, which means he never, not, he never yet not said no villainy. Notice the double negation. This was perfectly standard English at the time. Now this would be considered non-standard. Someone might even say it's illogical, but it's not. This used to be the standard, now it's not. Languages always change. And standard American English has changed away from this. And standard UK English has also changed away from this multiple negation pattern. Also, the words like ain't, this a prefixing stuff, these are all things that used to be part of the standard language. They dropped out and they're preserved in regional dialects. So standard versus non-standard dialects. Most large scale societies, think like countries, have a mix of regional and standard dialects. 
So usually each person will speak some regional dialect or some ethnic dialect or a class-based dialect, and they will also speak the standard dialect, and they will switch which one they use based on style and register and so on. Where these standard dialects come from is actually different from country to country. As we saw in the US, our standard dialect um, became entrenched due to broadcast media. In other cases, this has been a more sort of top-down imposed process. So for example, in France, the standard dialect is based on the Parisian dialect of France, the dialect, dialect of France that was spoken in Paris. The government of France decided this is the standard dialect now, and they mandated that all schools teach it. So that was a more of a process of top-down control, which established the standard dialect in France. Um, but as we're going to see, there's other ways that standard dialects can emerge. There's a huge variety of ways in which standard dialects emerge. In extreme cases of this, you get something called diglossia. Diglossia is a situation where people from different regions actually speak mutually unintelligible dialects, but they all speak also a standard dialect, but they only use it in writing and they only use it to speak with people from other regions. So this is like, imagine that in the US, if you speak your regional California dialect and you meet someone from say Virginia, when you're speaking a regional dialect, you cannot understand each other at all. But then you both switch to standard American English and now you understand each other fine. Or maybe you will actually write so that the other person can understand and then you understand each other fine. So this would be diglossia. We do not have diglossia in the United States today. So in the United States today, our dialects are not really very different from each other. It's not really that hard to understand someone from a different region in the US. Whereas in areas where the um, difference between regional and standard language has had longer to diverge, you can have this diglossia situation. So in these areas where you have diglossia, people from the same region almost never speak the standard dialect in daily life. So when you say, you know, when you're at home and you say your sibling or something, hand me the toothbrush, you would never say that in the standard dialect. You might not even know the word toothbrush in the standard dialect because all you would know in the standard dialect is, you know, formal stuff. So an example of diglossia would be what the situation in medieval Europe. So in medieval Europe, every day, in everyday life, people spoke local dialects. So just thinking of the Romance language area, people spoke their own regional dialects of what we would now call French or Spanish or Italian or Catalan. At the time, though, this was a giant dialect continuum with no clear boundaries among the dialects. And in many cases, there was mutual unintelligibility. Someone from Madrid would not understand someone from Rome when they're speaking their regional dialect. But in writing or on formal occasions, you would use Latin. You would write in Latin or you would talk in Latin. That would enable people from distant regions to communicate with each other, despite the fact that their own regional languages are mutually unintelligible. This in medieval Europe even extended to, say, non-Romance languages, things like German, Slavic languages like Polish, languages like English. People who spoke all these different languages could communicate with each other in Latin because Latin was the standard language. How did Latin become the standard language? Well, it was based in, a, in religion and the history of the Catholic Church and its influence on medieval Europe. Another example, which currently exists still today, is modern Arabic. So in areas where modern Arabic is spoken, everyday communication happens in local dialects, things like Egyptian Arabic, Gulf Arabic, Moroccan Arabic, etc. Here's a dialect map of the Arabic speaking regions of the world. And the dialects here are all colored different colors. And the ones that are like very different colors are actually mutually unintelligible. So someone who speaks, what say the um, Gulf Arabic is not going to immediately understand someone who speaks Moroccan Arabic if they both speak, if they both speak their regional dialects. However, when that happens, when they meet each other, what happens is they switch to the standard Arabic language, which is based on the classical Arabic language as it was used in the religious text, the Quran. So in writing and formal conversation and formal communication, you use modern standard Arabic, classical Arabic. So how did this become the standard dialect? It was again based on the fact that this was a language used in an important and unifying religious text. 
The last example I want to show of diglossia is German. This is a situation which does not so much hold in modern Germany anymore, but which held very strongly until the 20th century. So until the late 19th century, the standard German language, which you would hear a lot of in modern Germany and which you are going to learn if you take a German class now, that standard German language was strictly a written language. So people did not in everyday life speak in standard German. Rather, they spoke in regional dialects, which were mutually unintelligible, especially for largely geographically separated regions. In fact, the pronunciation of standard German was decided on by a committee, a committee that was trying to figure out how it should be standardly pronounced in theater productions. That tells you something about how standard German was used. It was used in like art, it was used in theater productions, but until that committee decided on how it was going to be pronounced, there wasn't a standard pronunciation for standard German because it wasn't really a spoken language. So this is a dialect map of German-speaking areas. And again, the colors that are very different from each other represent mutually unintelligible dialects. So it's interesting to note where this standard language came from. Where did standard German come from? It's an especially interesting case because standard German was never actually a dialect that was naturally spoken by any speech community. So with Latin, that used to be the native language spoken by, you know, Romans, and uh, classical Arabic, that was the actual language spoken by, you know, people, by Arabic speakers in, you know, around 700 AD or so. And the German language, the standard German language, was actually developed as a sort of compromise language among these different dialects. So in most cases, a standard dialect is formed by choosing one regional dialect and then just making that the standard. In the case of German, the standard was actually kind of made up. It was developed in large part by one person, by Martin Luther, who in the 16th century was trying to translate the Bible into German. And he had this problem. He wanted to translate it into German, but what is German? How, what could he translate it into such that people, speakers of all these different dialects would understand it? And so he actually traveled around the country. He listened to what people were saying in everyday life. And he invented, he sort of cobbled together a sort of compromise dialect that he thought most people would be able to generally understand. And this was based also in large part on existing sort of uh, compromise dialects that had been put together by traders in the area. And then because his translation of the Bible became so influential in this area, that ended up leading to that particular sort of made up dialect becoming the standard language. So this is a particularly interesting case because it shows that standard dialects can come from all kinds of places. They are in many cases regional dialects that are chosen, but they can also be sort of invented languages, which spread because of the popularity of particular books in the same way that standard American English spread because of the popularity of broadcast media.